Thank you, James. Um, and, and thanks to uh, Howard and, and John Luca for the invite. Hopefully everybody can, can hear me. Can you, can you hear me, James? Yeah, uh, fantastic. So it's, uh, I guess, a testimony to, to the people who are organising this, how successful it's been. I've got my uh, R for HGA mug from 2019, and I think it's continued to grow um, having things online. Um, so I'm here today uh, to... Hmm. Can I share my screen? Oh, James, maybe you need to change it. That's... Settings and security. So... Oh, no, you can share it. Is that, is that just showing Slack or is that showing everything? That's showing everything. Okay, brilliant. Okay, fantastic. Uh, sorry for that. So um, as as uh, you'll appreciate, we like a, a good pun. Um, so I, I'm going to present first, and then and then Rose is going to continue on. And so I'm focusing more on the um, on, on a paper we wrote, which is a simple reproducible example, and some of the overview. And then Rose is going to take it on to the uh, industry um, kind of specific um, and implications of, of using Shiny in uh, in industry with her experience in, in Bresmed. Um, so I want to say from the outset that this is very much collaborative uh, work. The paper published by myself and Paul, and a lot of the uh, a lot of the kind of thoughts gone into it between the two of us. And I'm very good at, at sitting here and listening to the sound of my own voice, but uh, much of this is, is Paul Snyder's work. Um, so Paul and I are based at the School of Health and Related Research, University of Sheffield, um, and also work at, at Dark Peak Analytics. Um, and I'm currently working at the Joint Biosecurity Centre. Um, but the, the views in this presentation are, are my own and de definitely not that of the Joint Biosecurity Centre. Um, so to get straight into what I believe kind of the current process for a lot of, of HTA and the problems that, that arise from that are. Um, so, so I believe that a lot of the, the inputs for, for health economic models would come from uh, modelling done in, in R or, or um, Stata. Um, they would get input into a, a model, maybe in Excel or using VBA. Those would be exported, some plots created, some outputs created, put into a Word document, and then maybe presented using PowerPoint and, and circulated more widely. Um, and that's kind of how I, I see the current, current process. And I, I think how a lot of the people, when I'm very much preaching to the, the choir here, uh, potentially see, see this process changing is moving towards something something where we're working all in one software environment. So there you might, for example, do survival modeling in R, take the results of that directly in R into a, a model constructed using R, for example, in, in uh, the wonderful HeSIM package or, or any other package or, or, or a custom, custom model, um, create a load of plots in ggplot, again in R. You could even write a report in Markdown um, and, and then display results and uh, uh, investigate the model more using R Shiny. And I think going even more broad, broadly than that, the, the use of GitHub, um, latex editors, uh, static repositories, and linking them all with um, kind of publication uh, formats um, may, mean that we can really leverage the, the power of um, script based models. Um, so you can have models that are are shared so that everybody can see them online. All of the code is, is openly available um, and the model can be, can be manipulated by, by others and, and kind of parameters can be changed and varied um, so that people can kind of see how the, the model's working and uh, the results of that model. So it's, it's as transparent and efficient uh, a process as it can possibly be. Um, so what, what are the benefits of this kind of move more to a kind of our environment? Uh, the biggest one for me is efficiency. Yeah, in one click, you can just update your entire model, uh, report everything. So when when a client says to you, "Oh, we we need to change this one input or this this one assumption," um, you can make that change one click. Everything gets updated. Um, the other one is the speed of of creating models. So once you've done something once in R, it's quite easy to to package that up. Um, write a load of functions to do the same thing so that you're not constantly redoing things uh, or copying pasting uh, things over in, into Excel spreadsheets. You're just calling a, a function from a package you've created. Um, another one is computational power. So um, 
the use of RCPP um, uh, and uh, parallel uh, programming uh, just make things much more efficient. Um, and a big one, as I mentioned, is, is code and data separation. Um, so the ability to separate your, your code, essentially your, your method um, from your data so that where data is sensitive, data could be kept out of, of publication or kept out of um, um, kind of anything, anything that's put out into the, the public domain while the code could be put into the public public domain. Uh, and that obviously improves sort of reproducibility, uh, the openness and transparency of, of health, health technology assessment. Uh, another one is, is reach and replication. So we could have one worldwide model set on a remote server that works for, uh, for lots of different countries. Uh, and this is particularly important in, in public health where you can imagine um, a lot of external agencies don't have funding for the types of things that we might fund in the UK or, or the US. Um, but once you've done, done the work and built the model once, often the same principles uh, apply to, to lots of different countries. Um, and so what, why not give that, um, get, provide that service to, to a lot of different countries? Uh, and the last one, which is what I'm going to talk about a lot today, is, is stakeholder engagement. Uh, people love to play with cool web apps. Um, it helps them get excited about, about modeling. It helps them become engaged with the model. Uh, and quite often, if you if you hand somebody a report and you say, we've done this uh, we, we've done this bit of work, here are, here are all our, our assumptions, uh, the, the decision maker may disagree with one assumption, and that may kind of taint their view of the whole report. Um, just that one assumption being um, uh, not aligned with, with their prior, prior expectation. And so if you give somebody a web app which, where you say, okay, you disagree with that one assumption, change that one assumption, rerun the model, it's, that, that, that assumption is not really material to the, to the decision. Um, that's incredibly valuable. So I think the, the biggest barrier uh, to, to the, the use of, of R, in my opinion, is a lack of a, a nice graphical user interface. Um, pretty much everybody can open Excel spreadsheet, play around and roughly figure out what's going on very, very quickly. Whereas much, much fewer people can open up R and understand what's going on uh, with a load of code. So um, with that in mind, the contribution that, that Paul and I felt that we could, could make to, to this kind of push and drive towards the use of R and HTA um, is making a simple reproducible example um, of how to wrap up a, um, a, a Markov model created by by a team in, called DAS over in uh, the Netherlands, but with kind of academics all over the world, um, into a, a simple shiny app. And the idea is that this would be an incredibly simple example that anybody could follow, and then could go on from there to, to kind of wrap up their own uh, their own models that they've written in R into into shiny apps, and then kind of continue to build those shiny apps into more and more sophisticated sophisticated applications. So I'm just gonna show you really briefly this very simple app. So this is incredibly simple, simple front end for the six sigma model. Uh, and the paper that, that I'll um, link in the chat in a second um, kind of goes into a lot more detail on what's actually happening in the six sigma model. But what we allow the user to change in this is just three very simple parameters, treatment cost, number of PSA runs, and the initial age of the, the population in the model. And then we have a button that allows the user to, to, to run and update the model. So obviously this is incredibly overly simplified, but it, it hopefully gives some indication of how we might expect um, the user to be able to uh, manipulate parameters using sliders and, and numeric values. And then we can kind of essentially talk through how to uh, kind of how to build this in a, in a simple reproduci reproducible example. Um, so at its simplest, we can think of a, uh, a model constructed in R as a, as a single function. And our, in, in our paper, we kind of go on to show kind of how you would, you would wrap up um, your, your entire model in, into one function. And that, that function takes a series of, of inputs. And they might be parameters like uh, the cost of, of different interventions or the discount rate and number of 
um, PSA runs, uh, that type of thing. And so all we're going to do is input into those inputs some shiny um, sliders and numeric values, and then run the model using those inputs, and then output a series of, of graphs and tables. So in the, the app I just showed you, uh, it had is incredibly simple and basically just has three parts. It has a title, six second model in shiny, which is, is shown in blue. It has a sidebar with some parameter inputs and a button to click run model. And then it has some outputs. And so we can see uh, from the code that we have a fluid page, um, which is a, just a type of, of, of UI. Uh, and then we have a title panel and then a sidebar layout, layout that has some code to construct it and a main panel, which contains our plots and um, tables, which also has some code. So the sidebar panel code just has simply a numeric input and that numeric input is called treatment cost and we give it an ID. So in this case, our, our ID is just called SI for shiny input and then cost of treatment. And the same for, for PSA runs uh, and the initial age of the, the population. And then we have something called an action button, which we call run underscore model, um, which will cause something to happen when, when run on the, the user in, on the server side. And in the main panel, we just have a heading called results table, which you can see here. And then we have a table output, which is created by a, a single function. And then a, a cost effectiveness plane header and a, a plot output. So as I said, absolutely most simple possible um, reproducible example. Um, so in the server side, all that's happening is that when the action button is pressed, so when we observe uh, run model, that input for the action button being pressed, we're going to run the, the what we call the rougher function, which runs the entire model using the inputs for the cost of treatment, um, the, the initial age, and the number of PSA runs. And then that function runs the entire model and returns a set of model results. And those model results are fed into um, a table function and a cost effectiveness plane function. And that's all that's in the server side. So that, that's the entire kind of app um, kind of breeze through in, in a few minutes. Um, but you can find out more uh, on the uh, publication uh, that's published in Welcome Open Research uh, in 2020, I think just, just pre-COVID, uh, wonderful time. So I wanted to also just quickly talk through a uh, uh, kind of more sophisticated app that we built, uh, again, as an, as an example app. Hopefully it doesn't take too long to load. So the paper uh, I was talking about is, is here. Um, and kind of goes through in much more detail, kind of the rough function and, and the dark, um, the dark group function. Uh, so this is, okay. So this is our kind of slightly more sophisticated model. And this model allows you to, to see kind of base population survival and change some parameters. Um, you can see um, the distribution of uh, relative risk of, of, of death once you're in the, in the sixth state. Uh, you can uh, fit uh, different distributions uh, to the to the um, survival curves um, and extrapolate from those. So here we've we've got the y ball as the the default, but you can fit any of these different options, and then compare those. We have costs and utilities and the and the distributions in the PSA that you can input. And then you can decide how many PSA iterations to run. And so when you click run model, this should run. Uh, so it runs a thousand iterations um, in 50 to, to 80 years um, cycle, uh, 50 to 80 cycles, so year cycles. And it's a time dependent state, tra state transition probability um, model uh, using uh, RCPP, so C++ code, uh, to speed it up quite considerably. And then we get you know, a series of, of normal looking outputs in the app and some functionality that I quite like. So you can download a slide deck, Word document, and a CSV of, of PSA runs, and email yourself the results if you want. So I can email myself any of those outputs. 
and then it'll go and create those. And that, that can be really useful if you're if you're running a model that's going to take quite a long time. You could, could run that in the background and then have it sent to you kind of when you're ready. Um, so I go to my email address. I can now see that, that it's run that that model, created a, a slide pack, and it should very shortly send that through. It's going to be a bit slow to update. So here's example one for earlier. And you can see that, for example, in the PowerPoint, which is very, very slow to load while I'm on Zoom, uh, you can see the example slide back with cost effectiveness planes, et cetera, et cetera, uh, based on the selections that, that I've just used in the, in the app. So that's a, a kind of fairly brief uh, overview and keen to take take questions on on things and um also pass over to, to rose uh, to talk more industry industry specific things yeah should we take questions at the end for both our talks given that they are related i think that's wise yeah excellent i'm just going to share my screen then right can everyone see my slides lovely yeah excellent Right, so thank you so much, Rob. Um, so now on to part two of this. I am Rose Hart, I'm a Sydney Health Economist at Bresmed. Um, and I'll be continuing this talk by outlining some of our experiences to date. Um, so first, just stepping away from Shiny, the use of our in general for a consultancy perspective is that we do use a lot for driving our statistical analysis. But Rose, as... sorry, it's a little bit difficult to hear you. Is it possible to speak louder or put the microphone Hello? closer? Is, is that right? Is that better? Is that better at all? Marginally. <laughs> oh, people are saying, yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. That's fine. I prefer to use my headphones if possible. Um, yeah. But, oh yeah, okay. Um, yes, right, this might be a good My partner might be typing in the background, so I do apologize if that's, that, that's distracting. Um, so there is a clear preference in our models for the use of Excel. Um, and this makes sense given where the clients are coming from. Um, the ubiquitous availability of Excel, everyone seems to have it, even though it's not free like R is. There is a learning curve associated with alternatives. Um, anything different will take time. There's a HTA preference for Excel, um, and we'll cover that in a bit. Um, and also there is perceived transparency advantage. Uh, and this essentially that this perception comes from the fact that Excel comes with a built-in front end uh, where users can immediately see graphs and you know see formatted tables and this obvious this is often perceived as a more transparent than code um, especially for those who are not very familiar with code and like Rob highlighted there are however significant advantages to using R that benefit our projects the idea that the statistical analysis and the cost effectiveness analysis can be in one place um, so it's kind of end-to-end -end modeling from patient level data straight through to cost effectiveness analysis. Um, and also code can be much more efficient and transparent to write, uh, review and adapt, um, especially in large projects. Um, so there is that advantage for R. Um, but with users having to run and access codes, the reality is often that R is more access inaccessible to non-R users. And that this is, as Rob said, a major barrier to the widespread use of R um, for modeling, but the Shiny package overcomes this. It allows users to interact directly with R functionality without actually having to directly view or edit the code. And that's the key difference. And that's, that's the key thing that we're, we're looking at here. Um, so a while ago, we wanted to explore this, whether in a consultancy, it's actually feasible to be able to build a complex model uh, for HTA, because that's ultimately where we're most of, mostly going with this. Um, so we want to create a model that includes a lot of the advantages of R and Shiny um, that Excel struggles with. So we wanted that end-to-end -end modeling with everything in one place from patient data to cost effectiveness outcomes. We wanted complex statistical analysis. So, you know, things like having the, um, the um, uh, thing like matching analysis, um, having the parametric fitting in, in within an app, um, which you can't do in Excel. But also wants to use active front end with informative visuals and um, we want to go beyond what Excel has on offer already. So we used 
this uh, to create a case study, which we then published to um, this paper here from 2020. I will include references at the end um, to basically produce an explicit comparison between Excel and R um, for cost effectiveness analysis. So, uh, and the result of this was um, an R shiny model was developed and an Excel model was also developed. Um, and this was kind of validation and comparison. We shared our experiences. So, this is the decision problem we developed. Um, we wanted to be able to, uh, we, we produced a hypothetical party um, case study. Uh, we wanted to uh, simulate hypothetical data that was representative of this indication. So we had single arm um, hypothetical data and also a historical control arm, which I think we took from published evidence. We wanted to have and in the app to be able to match these cohorts and be able to have this user amendability of options. So we had to play with the covariates who actually are matching on. And then from that, take the match data and be able to um, extrapolate them using both parametric distributions and also mixed secure modeling. And also in the app, finally, we wanted to be able to model this for state transition models and also partition survival analysis. You know, so we really wanted to throw, throw everything out of this app, really, because this is how we see if it's feasible. Um, and after that, export the outcomes to Microsoft, um, Microsoft Word. So it's just a report, you know, it's just a basic template sort of thing. Um, so this is successful. Um, here is the app that we developed. It is freely, the front end is freely available uh, via this link um, and just sort of demonstrate um, what we can do with it. So we had this lovely, lovely tabs layout. Um, so it's easy to navigate. We had the introduction, background, general model information all put in. Um, we have a control sheet and this has all the things you'd standardly, sorry, more uh, normally see um, on a control sheet. Um, except you could also change things like model cycle as well as things like time horizon. We also wanted to have it where we simulated updating a data cut, you know, uh, so we had two different sets of PLD in here. So you could pick which PLD you wanted and the idea was to sort of say that if you had an, a data cut update, then you could just put it in the back of here and it would then take it forward. Uh, we also wanted to demonstrate that you could have uh, multiple uh, indications, uh, populations in this, and this would just filter down those groups as and when. Um, and also we wanted to have more than one um, source of, of costs. As we said, we wanted to petition the survival model and also state transition modeling options in there. Um, so we incorporated that. Um, but the most important thing for us is that the fact that we could do this, this quite in depth um, analysis of the data. So here we've got the, uh, we have two single arm trials and we had options to match. Um, so we have a save base case, which we just had um, as, a, as a base case for the model, but also you could do a naive comparison or life propensity score matching. So here I'm just selecting life propensity score and you can see this is now changed to options. And if you slow down, I don't know how many of you are familiar with matching analysis, but the idea is you have all your data and then you want to kind of um, you want to be able to match your data based on the propensity scores and decrease the standardized mean difference. It, it's very, it's a very oversimplified explanation. So the idea that all of these are decreasing means that there is an increase in the matching. Um, and you have here, as I'm sort of highlighting, but there's one that was, was, was going up in this case. Um, so what you can do for this, for instance, is deselect gender as a covariate. You could change a caliper, so that's how closely the data has to match update it, it will then rerun the whole analysis, um, produce your results, and then you use that going forward um, to fit your models to. Um, you can see here, for instance, we've got, a, you can, it's, it's not just, you know, here's your data, it's done. You can see how close the match is. So we had a perfect match there. Um, you can see this is the propensity for all the data, both trials. You can see this is the match scores and this is the scores that weren't matched. So you can see what that looks like. Um, there's also things like the variance um, and the statistics surrounding that data. So this is all a very, very powerful analysis that people can have access to. It's something that you usually don't sort of see. You've got statistics. You can compare the, the all data and the match data and the different outcomes. And here's your, your, the characteristics of the match data set. It's all there. And usually it's not. Usually it's just, it's just increasing the availability and the accessibility of these really complex analyses, which is a double edged sword, but that's another, another story. Um, the you could, from there it takes that match analysis and then uses it in the data you can see um, the kms um, the log cumulative hazard plots so you can take this forward and it would fit the data 
We've fitted it, got stratified, hazard ratio, and also mixture cure modeling options um, for both the comparator and the intervention. And this uh, is where you can then, uh, this is the live data. It fits the parametric models. You can have a look at the AIC and BIC statistics. You can change the time horizon. So this is good for expert visitation, taking them through the story and be able to hover over and see you know, what's happening at what time points of differences for different curves, be able to compare against the KM and be able to sort of say, actually, we don't want those two curves. What about these three? Are they appropriate? You know, so you can take people through a story using this kind of this kind of technology and the hovering. It, it all it all contributes to be able to take the user through this. Is this something that isn't available in Excel? And then we were very, very happy that we found uh, we could use using Shiny. So once you've selected your curves, you've done all that, we've got the results. Um, you know, we have the standard, you know, we'll run the model for the active um, settings, you've got your disaggregated, your incremental analysis, everything that you would generally expect to be in a HTA model is in this model. Um, got all our uh, curves um, and outputs, but also we have the advantage as well. We can, you can have, you know, output the patient flow sheets, so you can see those as well, and also generating report. Like Rob said, um, this doesn't have a capacity to email, although we have got our models with that functionality. So it'll, you know, paste your model result, create a, a table of contents and a dream. I mean, the absolute dream for somebody who's writing a HTA submission is that you can have your HTA template in the back and every time there's an update, which let's face it, you know, near the end, it could be updates, you know, uh, or someone at the, la at the uh, 11th hour decides to change your covariance to your matching analysis. You just click your covariance you don't want, rerun the analysis, output it to the report. You have to do a bit of your own, you know, thinking of, of you know, how, how to interpret, but that's all you have to do. It will do, take out all the copying and pasting. So you can spend more time thinking and not, and not just copying and pasting tables. Like that. So, that's really good. I mean, this is a very whistle-stop tour, so, but I just want to highlight, you've got your probabilistic and your deterministic analyses in here. There's things like mole diagnostics that we can incorporate. And there is also the option, we have got big parameters tables in here, so you can change distributions, your ranges, your standard error. You've got the multi live model switches and the curve parameters. So everything, my, my rule of thumb is everything that I think somebody would want to see in an Excel model is in here. So this was our proof of concept that this can be done. Um, so we made a Excel model, which there isn't time to really go through, but you, everyone's seen Excel models. Um, so here's our comparison between the two. Obviously the analytical capabilities are much higher in Shiny. We could do that matching analysis, that um, extrapolation, parametric extrapolation. Um, there's also the potential for equivalent data safety. I know I put the patient level data in here, but there is a version of this model that's not online where you push a button, it copies and pastes all the, the whole model to another project folder, and strips out all the patient level data and will only use the covariates. So you can have, you know, your HTA ready version where you're not submitting all your patient level data, but it will keep all the functions that you have used to analyze the patient level data. So it's all there. Um, model building for R did take longer than Shiny. Um, I'm more experienced in Excel than Shiny. Um, um, at, at the time I was. Um, so it did take a lot longer, but um, the fact that when you do updates, it's so much quicker, things like in data cuts, updates, matching analysis and all that. Um, so it depends on the sort of project you're doing. Um, many of the efficacy inputs in Excel though did require analysis to be coded in R anyway. So even if you weren't doing um, the uh, model in R, you still have to do the matching analysis, the parametric extrapolation and all that. Um, in R because you can't do that in Excel, obviously. Um, both models look were easy na na to navigate for non-technical and technical users. Um, Shiny, there was the advantage that everything was in one place. There's some transparency advantage there. Um, and also, like I said, the Shiny model is far more adaptable. Um, and you can enter modeling that outputs to Word and PDF. Um, but just to, neither good nor bad, the R Shiny does require a, an internet connection. So um, I, now I'd like to quickly go through the model development workflow that we have adopted internally to effectively be able to code these Shiny apps for multi-team projects. These are the big Shiny apps. So once you sort of learned and are, are thinking about Shiny, if you're having these big projects, these scalability, then this is something you might want to consider. Um, so like and this test, take the learnings from the papers that we did, like um, Rob's um, diagram, he had the inputs, the functions and the outputs. So this kind of follows that you have the informing the model part, which is the very step one, this is your bread and butter for all models. In Excel, you can take it, for, take it for granted. You've got your data table on a spreadsheet. 
you can reference it uh, with, a, with a, you know, just by clicking on it, you know, you've got name ranges. You don't have that in R, you need good data discipline. So in forming the model, having that foundation is, is very important for a big model. You then develop your full model independent on Shiny, um, where you've got your, uh, you're planning the content as, as you're designing both. And as you're developing this, you end up creating kind of bank of functions. And then eventually once you've got a full model developed independent of Shiny, it's your function bit, you then have your outputs, your sort of your front end. Um, and because you've already got this, it's easy to validate QC. Um, and um, it's, this is a lot easier to develop because of that. Um, so this is really good for also for parallel working within a big team. So you've got different people in different bits. Um, and also training up individuals are starting here where they should be, you know, that data discipline. Build, slowly building up the skills. So if you're new to Shiny, this is something that is you have to start making sure that you have that have that good that good um, uh, workflow. And just as an example, everyone loves a good freebie bit of code. Um, this is in the repository for the R in HTA GitHub, but I've included an example of this workflow with the code for the Briggs HIV model. So we've got the script, we've got your Shiny app. Um, and the thing to note is that you have your script, which you know, produces the, 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 the outcomes that were in the Excel version that's available online. Um, you go through that and then you look at the functions of the R code, uh, sorry, in the Shiny app rather, and you know the functionalities in the server. So if you look through the model script in the server, you'll see pretty much identical, barring that this has got been wrapped in Shiny function. So you can set direct transition to a Shiny app. It's a nice example of that. Um, and the function is used by both. So it produces exactly the same outcomes. So my final slide, I just want to summarize our findings for using H, um, Shiny within a HUR consultancy. So at present, there are many areas where Shiny is really useful to the development within the consultancy, and we're using it currently for things like early modeling tools, feasibility assessments, and value and communication. But there are several challenges to overcome if R, with or without Shiny, is to be consistently used in HGA submissions. Um, so for one thing, um, not all HTA agencies do accept R for submissions. Uh, we know that there are many groups that are pushing for increased awareness. I imagine some of them are going to be talking over the next couple of days. Um, but even though, even if HTAs do accept R, there can be skills shortfalls in ERGs. They don't always like reviewing R code and you have to be considerate of that. Um, and even, but even when agencies do accept R submissions, plenty of prior warning is needed and there needs to be justification for the choice of software and Shiny has an extra layer of, of functionality which doesn't help it in terms of sort of being able to lay out a script and be able to um, be able to be submitted um, given that there is already the skill shortfall. Um, but that said, we as a consultancy are, are really confident in this technology and this is definitely filling some issues that we have. So we are pushing to making a HTA submission at some point for the right project um, and a way of easing this way of being potentially doing this would be obviously to submit the model also have the code available without the Shiny and also be able to create a, an Excel model alongside. So we'd have a your Shiny model, you'd have all your covariates, all your, all your options, you then push your button and it will then push some of your, the, your curves, your covariates to your um, a, a, an Excel model template. And this um, would be great because you can validate each other. You know, it's, it's a really nice uh, way of being able to get our shiny to put in the door and the technology is already there it, it's been proved you know it, it is there it's it's happy to do but it's just making you know easing people into technology um and we are seriously into this so if anybody knows of a project where this would fit the bill then do let me know um but in conclusion um we are starting to see greater need for alternatives and R with shiny is so far managing to meet all the areas that excel is struggling in um so we are seeing more requests, um, which is very exciting for us. Um, so that brings me to the end of our presentations. Um, we're happy to take any questions. We have reference. We'll be submitting. Well, sorry, we'll be distributing the slides after. I haven't looked at the chat, but I have seen there's quite a lot of questions. So um, yeah, shall we? So we've got five ten minutes, I think. I don't know what time it is. I think, I think we have five minutes. Thanks very much, Rose, and thanks, Rob. I thought those are two very very uh, clear presentations. Definitely the user interface that Rose presented is uh, very beautiful, but clearly very heavyweight in terms of the what it, it covers. 
Uh, this presentation is frankly a moderator's nightmare because it's elicited so many questions that have come up in the chat and I don't think we're going to be able to cover them all. Also, Rob has been um, responding to a lot of them as, uh, as they've gone and other people have been chipping in with uh, particular observations and resources, which is really lovely because you can tell everybody is very engaged in this. Um, if, is there anybody that would really like to come forward uh, and uh, offer, ask a question? Um, I, I think I'd, I'd like to ask if, if anybody is particularly keen. Um, um, I can see uh, uh, there were some, some particularly interested um, uh, Kashif Siddiqui, and, and I think was, was asking some of the earlier questions. I don't know, uh, do we have hands going up uh, here? Okay, oh, Arthur, let's see. Uh, Arthur, do you, can I, let's see, can I unmute you? No, can, are you able to unmute yourself? Me yeah, go ahead, please, Arthur. Okay, hi guys, so two really fantastic talks. Thanks, I really enjoyed them, and like the software that you produced was I think Howard described them as beautiful and I would completely agree. Really, really impressive. Um, so my question was kind of, um, I guess, in, in relation to, to what you're doing. So, so both of, it seemed like the idea was to, to definitely have the server like um, online, right? So, you, so, so whoever was interacting with the interface, instead of working on something locally on a machine, they would be going to a website, basically. So like, obviously, with with many HTAs, nearly all of them, I guess, right? I mean, the information in them is, is very, very sensitive and, and companies are very, and I think Rose, maybe you mentioned in passing um, that, that that can be addressed or you could kind of guarantee the same levels of, of, um, of, of data safety. I guess I was just kind of wondering, I mean, are you guys aware or do you have a sense of, of what you need to do to, to kind of ensure that that, that that information could be safe, right? Because obviously, you know, if I get, I, I don't know, I think we still do this, right? I mean, you, you get the, the H, the model on on a USB key, and then you install it on your own machine, right? So there's kind of quite a lot of security there, right? Whereas obviously, if you're going to something online, potentially other people have access to that. Um, I mean, so I guess yes. Yeah, so the question to either of you is: is have you thought about that? Have you had a chance to kind of address that issue, or has that come up? Um, yeah, that's come up several times. I'm trying my headset again. Can everyone hear me? I can hear you well. Yeah. Excellent. So um, when we're doing this with our client projects at the moment, uh, like so, not done HTA, but um, we've got if we have patient level data we have it on a separate server so the model sits online uh, we do it via rstudio connect um, so that sits on our servers we've got complete control we have our own registered logins and there's an extra level of security um, we have our data on a separate server so when someone logs into the model they then verify the details and internally it checks we have details and then reach into a separate server it's an IT issue um, but it's it, we, we've been doing it, and the the our client IT team, who knows a lot more about me about me about security, reviewed it completely, and they've been okay with it. So if you use if you if you do have this problem, um, there are, and it is it is patient level data, then things like R Studio Connect. Um, I think you can pay for subscriptions for to R Studio I R Shiny Apps IO, I think, to pay for you know user logins as well. So um, but yeah, it, it's possible essentially. So we have a yeah sim similar thing of either hosting um, the the app from from your own server. Um, you can run these locally, um, and you can wrap these up into um, um, in, into files that you could then store on a on a USB. Um, so it is possible to do that uh, using a, a package called Electron, uh, which basically takes takes R and Shiny and everything else puts it all into one executable file. And then you could carry that around on a, on a USB with you. It, trouble is they tend to be quite big files. So they're a bit cumbersome compared to, a, to an Excel file. Um, but I think this is something that comes up a lot. And it, it is something that I, I think will gradually be addressed and concerns will gradually decrease because so much data, so very sensitive secure data is held on online servers. This isn't this isn't something that's unique to uh, HTA, um, and eventually I think people are going to get less concerned and less worried about having stuff on like Amazon server or wherever else because it's much more secure than giving somebody a, a USB um, or, or emailing it or something. So yeah. Um. Okay, uh, Gianluca, I see you have a hand up. I'm asking for extreme brevity. 
Yes. Um, only to add uh, to the very good um, uh, answers uh, that we've heard already that you can effectively package your, your Shiny app as if you were any other R package. And so you can install it to your machine and then you, know, you can carry your own laptop, which may be fully secure. And as a modeler, you can go into the nice meeting. You can go to, into your clients with the web app that doesn't run anything on the cloud. So you know, there are ways around it. Super. That was a brief comment. That was uh, fantastic. Uh, well, thanks very much. That was an absolute zinger of a start for the. Uh, so I'm I'm really pleased. That's thrown down the gauntlet for for everybody else. So um, I'm just going to go back and share my screen so I can uh, bring up the next presentation. So we should. Uh,